So 2001, 2002, Stanzas in the Form of a Dove uh, is the title, and that's from Borges, from Invocation to Joyce. I caught a whiff of Isabel last night, realized she needed a bath. I was so tired, but I gave her a bath, helped her with her pajamas, put her to bed. Just before she fell asleep, I was asleep next to her. I thought she was asleep. She said, Mom? Yes. I have a question about being good or bad. I know you should be good, but if you're not, what can they do to you? I mean, my question is, do I always have to be good? Does she always have to be good? When I was a girl, I knew I must always be good because I was bad. The filth. Look what original son, sin has done for me. So I say to her, no, you don't always have to be good. You are good. She breathes a sigh of relief. Thank you. Then falls right to sleep, smelling so sweet. What is death, she asks another day. The day they ask or the day you have to tell them. I was looking at a picture album with her on the couch, showing her the one of Nani with Pa fresh off the boat, posed in finery. He sits, the patriarch, and she stands behind him, a look of unspeakable pain on her face. The old man of 35 went back to Sicily to get himself a bride, a servant for his tyrannical, poor, illiterate parents in their tenement in East Boston. I turn the page to the pictures of us kids. I say each of our names, Linda, Caroline, Richard, Joey, Michael. I notice for the first time that Joey's standing next to me in each of the pictures. The little kids, she says, and you were the big one. Today I drove around and around, focused intently on trying to find a place to park on Lakeshore. Mama, she said from her car seat, watching my face in the rear view mirror, are you sad because you're thinking about your brother who died? No, honey, I said, astonished. I'm just worried because I can't find a parking spot. Rereading Long Day's Journey into Night, the bitterness starts on page 42 with Mary, of course, Bitterly resentful, bitterly, bitterly, her bitterness receding, Tyrone, a tired, bitterly sad old man, Jamie, bitterly. I count 33 instances of bitterness in the stage directions in this play about an Irish American family. The characters also do things angrily, violently, pleadingly, hopelessly, pitifully, philosophically, stupidly, pathetically, resentfully, tenderly, miserably, contemptuously, provocatively, and, of course, sentimentally. Don't be bitter, Linda. Um, the next two things are from uh, the summer of 2012 when we were staying in New York for a month. And this one is called The Soul Must Stay Where It Is, and it begins with a quote from John Ashbery's A Poem on, of Unrest. Do those towers even exist? We must look at it that way, along those lines, so the thought can erect itself like plywood battlements. Friday night in New York on my way to see Ashbury at Poet's House, as we hurried toward the subway, walking past the hospital where she was born, Isabel offered to come to the reading with me, and I said, no, no, you go, and I watched her walk down the stairs to the L to Williamsburg, where she was conceived. At rush hour, I walked toward the towers or where the towers were when I was pregnant 17 years ago at this time of year in this chartreuse light and heat. When I was married, when I lived in New York, when, 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 then. Go, 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 Walt Whitman's words from Crossing Brooklyn Ferry scroll digitally across the front of an office building. I stopped to read and look. Not one of the thousands rushing to New Jersey transits seems to notice the enormous words. The impalpable sustenance of me from all things at all hours of the day, the simple, compact, well-joined scheme, myself disintegrated, everyone disintegrated, yet part of the scheme. Would he write a different poem now about America? I stop near City Hall to get a sandwich. I'm the only one in the place. I forgot to bring a book. I don't even have a pen. There's nothing to do but look. I sit still long enough, enough to notice two detectives on the corner. They're well-groomed and camouflaged in suits, still and watchful in the midst of the river of commuters, hot. 
Everyone except me is racing for a train or a cab or the ferry to New Jersey. Thousands of people are passing and the detectives are watching all of them while I watch the detectives. It's a straight shot to City Hall from here. I can see the limousine pulling out under trees as green as salad, cop cars and police all around. The mayor will not be killed tonight as he heads out to the Hamptons for the weekend. A phalanx, a word you'd never use unless it's the right one. I watch the white plain clothes cop next to the black SUV parked illegally. He looks like me, stocky, thick eyebrows, dark, kind of like the enemy. Where are you from? The old man asked me on the subway platform to Jackson Heights the other day. Do you speak Arabic? The next day, a lady asked me if I was Iranian. No, I said, it's just the Clairol talking. I, I am still dark, but fading with age. The white detective has heavy earlobes, nice pants, a wedding ring, a boxer's nose. I'm in awe of his concentration. He sees everything but me. Unwatched, I eat like a pig. I've been watching the white plain clothes cop for about 15 minutes. I should go. My hands smell like mayonnaise. I fix my lipstick and walk out onto the sidewalk, hit by a blast of heat and swampy salt air. 2,000 people have passed this cop without seeing him. I make a point of smiling at him as I pass. He doesn't smile back, but I see him flinch at being seen. At the corner, there's a halal food cart next to trash cans and scaffolding. The proprietor is prostrated on the filthy sidewalk behind his cart angled toward Mecca, toward Queens, New York. A broker in a suit almost steps on him. A nearly naked anorexic jogger kicks him by accident while waiting for the light to turn. Nothing moves him. Maybe he is also a detective? I walk toward the water, toward a man with extension cords wrapped around his waist, looking for some place to be plugged in. This piece is um, about my friend Eileen Miles, and since uh, at that time they were using the pronoun her, I'm going to let that stand. And I know that's okay with Eileen. It begins with a quote from Eileen, always following disaster, even when I was a kid. Long stories, believe me, several steps behind damage. When a mother says, keep your eyes on them, and she goes on dumping potatoes in the water, she probably doesn't know you will go on watching them for the rest of your life, as if anything could make you stop. And uh, I don't know if I said the title, it's called Doll Values. One, sitting in Cafe Mogador, waiting for Isabel and Eileen, I take out my newspaper. Two, there were too many people on the pleasure boat that night on the Long Island Sound. The little girl had decorated her room with butterflies and elephants, so there were butterflies and elephants on her coffin. Three, here's what they do with the rotting carcasses of horses. A truck picks them up, maggots and all. They go into ladies' cosmetics, says the man who shovels the mess into a truck. Lotions and creams. Grease and horror redeemed, churned into beauty butter. Four, this week in death, Don Cornelius, he, he was the MC of Soul Train, Mike Kelly, Dorothea Tanning, Bishlau Shimborska, and that little girl and the boy on the boat. The kids were watching 4th of July fireworks on a boat named the Candy One. There is no Candy Two. I suddenly realized I don't really believe that women die, so they can't escape suffering. Five, Isabel arrives wearing a plaid polyester skirt, not what she was wearing when she left the house in Brooklyn this morning. She looks sheepish and beautiful and sweaty, and she smells like the thrift store. The skirt's too big for her, so she's rolled it at the waist. She keeps coming home from the Goodwill with clothes that might have been my clothes in the 1980s. One day, she brought home a crop top that looked just like what I wore at my brother's deathbed. Six, Eileen comes and locks her bike with a heavy chain. It takes a long time, the chain rattling like something in a dungeon. She's so handsome, her teeth, and she sounds like everyone I grew up with the way I still sound when I read aloud to children. The first time I met Eileen 17 years ago in a gallery, I was newly pregnant with Isabel. I was kneeling to get something out of my bag and I looked up and Susan introduced us. Have you met Eileen? Linda's from Boston too. 
I remember the blue rayon dress I was wearing that night. It cost $45 at Street Life on Broadway, a lot of money for me. It was shorter than the dresses I usually wore. It made me feel so pretty. I wore it in Italy with my husband early in my pregnancy. Annunciations, nativities, last suppers and crucifixions, depositions, resurrections, assumptions and ascensions, a few Magdalens, and on St. Pa- St. Joseph's Day, the Pietà. I looked at a hundred Madonnas in that dress and I became a Madonna in that dress. By the eighth week, it was too tight for me. Later in California, after I lost so much weight, I took it out of storage. It had a low neckline that I could pull down when I needed to nurse. Seven, my brother Joey was a snob. You couldn't eat candy or fried food in front of him without being criticized. In the polyester era, he wore only cotton, wool, or cashmere, no blends. Not even when he worked as a bar boy at Studio 54, and when he wore those tiny pinstriped cotton shorts that shocked me. One night we arranged to meet down here to go to the public theater. I arrived eating Starburst two at a time. How can you eat those, he said. It's like eating a candle or something. In all the old pictures, he has positioned himself next to me and I'm ignoring him. He had looked up to me. Now he was ashamed of me. I gave the rest of my candy to a homeless man lounging in front of Cooper Union, making a little show of my tenderness. Joey just kept walking. I had to run to catch up with him. It was always like that with him, like I might never see him again. And then one day I never saw him again. Eight, it's the longest day of the year and feels like it. Why do we get this much time? The light angles into the cavern of the street. It's in their eyes and they can't see me. I watch them while they eat. My writer, my daughter, my tiny, tiny minus. And uh, I think I'll end with a section from 2008 about my son who came into my life through the foster care system uh, when he was 17. And um, I think it's probably self-explanatory. As you see, I write a lot about America, uh, life in the superpower. a superpower with so many problems. 2008, Marcus is still on probation and Dick Cheney is still free, sick country. Court date is next week. I submitted my report assuring the judge that Marcus is working toward his GED and should be let off probation and allowed to continue in the foster care system for one more year with subsidy. Yesterday I learned that I need to provide proof of Marcus's enrollment in an adult school since he's dropped out of high school. I take a sick day to get it. I go out to East Oakland and wait in a trailer for a clerk to give me the paperwork. Take a seat. I'm the only white person there. People come and go and get their paperwork. The young clerks conspicuously ignore me for a while, comparing their gel nails. I know what I look like to them, a white lady who wants to save black kids and get a prize for it. The whole thing, history, this situation, me being here, it's all fucked up. I know. I'm being tested and the only way to pass today's test is to shut up and wait and not make it all about me. Finally, one of them calls me up to the counter. What can I do for you? She says, almost like a dare. And everything goes fine from there. At our court date, things go right, despite the fact that Marcus's public defender, an Irish American with the bulbous nose of an alcoholic, calls him the wrong name again and again in his statements to the judge. Marcus's other attorney, the one assigned by the foster care courts, is brilliant on his behalf. Marcus will not be locked up, and I'll have a year to get his general education degree, and the stipend will continue. In the hallway, Marcus's grandmother surprises me with a hug before she heads back to tell her prayer group that God heard their prayers. They say that we can go downstairs to expunge his juvenile criminal record. The door to the clerk's office is locked for her safety. I hit the buzzer a little too hard and waved her through the glass. I have the same bracelet, she says, pointing to my fake ivory jewelry, and we laugh because we know we got a good deal. She makes quick work of our papers. In the car, Marcus says, did you see that? She let you right in because you're white. I said, yes, but some black folks folks are suspicious of all white people, and I can see why. Well, not her, he said. You're probably right. 
Maybe my whiteness makes it easier to get through that door, or maybe it was the bracelet. Anyway, today it's making your life better. I don't tell him about my long afternoon waiting for help at the adult school. After I dropped him off at his grandmother's, I heard an ice cream truck on 65th Street playing that old standard, Turkey in the Straw, with a deep rap beat mixed in under the melody. In seven months, I've logged hundreds of hours getting us through the system, writing reports, driving him around and feeding him, spending money I don't have, talking with social workers and attorneys and teachers and the court-mandated white psychologist who cautioned me to keep my distance from Marcus as he might be dangerous. I'm tired, but most of all, I'm relieved. The forest fires up north have cast a pall over Oakland. I drive Marcus home in air that's thick and hard to breathe. I drop him off downtown. Now he is free. I go through my book of Fridays, the journals I kept about our afternoons together, and my notes for the reports I wrote for the judge, telling the court what it wanted to hear in language it could understand, leaving out the most important stuff, the stuff you can't say. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, and to remember that if you want to make um, comments or ask some questions, that you can put them into the chat in the side. Um, our next writer is poet Jane Robinson. Uh, Jane Robinson is yeah. writer in residence at the Redline Book Festival in Dublin. Her book, Journey to the Sleeping Whale, was published by Salmon Poetry and received the Shine Strong Award for Ireland's Best Debut Poetry Collection in 2019. Her poems have also won the Strokestown International Poetry Award, received the Shine Strong, oh sorry, <laughs> the Red Line Book Festival Poetry Prize 2015 and for the Patrick Kavanagh Award 2015 and runner-up for the 2019 Ginkgo Eco Poetry Award. Based in Dublin, Jane studied at Trinity College and then the California in Institute of Technology, where she earned a PhD in biology. And then she worked as a research professor in the University of Arizona for 10 years before coming home. She was the Irish Writer Centre's 2019 Writer in Residence in Norway, as well as a Poet in Residence at the Archive of the National Centre for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, India in 2019. Her poems have been on Lyric FM's Poetry Jukebox and on the RTE Poetry Programme. Her recent poem cycle called For the Atoll is a musical collaboration and has been performed at the Far Flung Trio uh, recently. So we'll, let's please welcome Jane Robinson. Hello, um, and, and thank you very much, Jessamine, for that lovely introduction. And thanks for inviting me to read on um, this program. So, um, and Jessamine asked me to lift up my book and show you the, the cover. It's called Journey to the Sleeping Whale, published by the fabulous Salmon Poetry Press. Um, and uh, the cover was painted by Bertie Pringle. It's from a painting by Bertie Pringle. So, um, I'm going to read. Uh, usually, when I do a reading, I like to um, give myself a theme, and um, I decided maybe I would pick out poems that mention birds today. Um, so I'll start with a very small one um, at the beginning. Sorry about that noise, that's a door in the room. <laughs> um, so uh, on the way out, high tide, cormorant on rock. And um, when I was writing that, I was thinking of my dad who spent six years, all the time I was in secondary school, he um, made a homemade boat in the garden here where we live in Dublin. And then he sailed it off around the world. Um, and he was um, very strong about, you know, worried about climate change long before it became uh, mainstream news. Um, so this next poem, Meteorological Upset. Three starlings flew to a hole in the Arctic ice and landed on our washing line. So then we come to a longer one. So I'm navigating through my collection um, by looking for poems that have birds in them. 
And there are very many different themes sort of entangled in the collection. So I actually had a lot of fun preparing this reading for you. This one is called Mona Lisa. So you'll recognize that it is um, concerned with Leonardo da Vinci. And I just wanted to remind you that he was a lifelong vegetarian. And um, apparently he would buy birds from the markets in Italy and set them free. This is called Mona Lisa. Bird flown through time, love child, magician, magician's vision from the future past, past master of volume and dimension, dimension traveler, who is it who spins so fast, faster than the speed of anything known? Known and unknown, everything's adventure, adventurer for you. O oh, frowning man, man don't frown, let rip the song and catch, catch your thought before it vanishes. In vanishing, it leaves the crooked smile. Crooked smile? See how she almost banished it. Banished the aviatrix green grin. She is miles and miles away. Portrait of a vision. Vision model twisted through from modern, modern times, yes, to Leonardo's mind. Leonardo's mind is sandbox echo chamber, chambering each thought bounced back and forth back and forth, translation and transversion, versions mirrored and reflected his mouth. His mouth is filled with beaks and wings of birds. The nights are long now. Mm. The spider took me and she spun me in her web, tent pegs through the heart. A bite on the thigh, numbing my foot, I fell from the bed. Feet tangled in my winding sheet of silk, mouth papered over with moth wings. I forgot to listen when the owl called my name. So um, the next birds I come to are in um, a, a crown of sonnets called Memories of Flight at the Life Museum. And in fact, birds pop in and out of the stanzas in various guises. So I'm just going to read you section 10. Um, I'm sort of combining looking at my book here and um, looking at a very long PDF on screen. So excuse my little bit of muddling around while I find the next um, the next room. Okay. Memories of Flight at the Life Museum, part 10. Of the extinct and the endangered, blue-throated ones choking, I'd hold their throats if I could, range over time, backwards to then, and forwards to what might be tomorrow again. Sphyxes macaw, dead in captivity, three specimens. Sharps Rail, Leiden Museum, 1865, extinct. I'd cradle their heads in my hands and hold their throats so they couldn't join the greatest marsupial carnivore dead. And um, that greatest marsupial carnivore was, of course, the thylacine, which was um, you know, a, a sort of a marsupial wolf, really, um, that became extinct due to humans hunting it. Um, so then I come back to um, section two of the book, and again, a little epigraph on the way home, ebbing tide, heron on rock. Um, now I'm going to jump away from my collection and go to uh, a new poem um, called Night, uh, which um, is set in the um, Museum of the Zoology Department in Trinity College, Dublin. And I need to explain that arsenical soap was used in um, preparing um, skins of, of animals for preservation um, in taxidermy. Night. I hold a strange bird the size of a little child or a large duck, my arms around her chest, the feathers firm and cool under my fingers, her be beak rested on my shoulder. Feel the pulse in her neck throb against my own neck 
and we are flying, soaring away underwater, spinning through salt spray, the glorious swoop like a dream of flying downstairs. When I think this is a dream, I wake in a small place where I stand alone on a rock with a bird the size of a baby, but she's wooden and cold, her feet held rigid with wire. Recognising case 20 in the display, where Harvey and Kirby and Davis passed the bird to Burkett, who with arsenical soap cured this last skin of a young female, not in good plumage. I'm peering in. No, in the way of dreams, I'm both outside and inside, trapped by a case, picturing bludgeoned birds crying and bleeding behind me. And then I wake, I really wake up this time with a scatter of glass on the museum floor, heart blood pounding my ears, though we lost the great orc 150 years ago. No more sleep in the empty night. No more sleep on this watch. And then back, back to um, connection. Why do we do this? It hurts me on the apex of the tragus, right below the super tragic notch. Those diamond drill bits, oil wells, water wells, oil wells, driven deep through subcutaneous limestone. It pierces to the bone. I'd remove the hard metallic studs and salve her wounds with comfrey, heelol, knapweed, stew hyssop with wild strawberries, feed the birds and teach them how to speak. And then the last one I read from my collection is called Single Handed. Um, has anybody noticed how I'm doing for time? I forgot to turn on my timer. I'll keep going for um, one more poem from my collection and then one new one. Single handed. My boat's been at sea so long, I'm starving. Can't eat these sandwiches pinned to my sleeve, cucumbers over my eyes. What's in your pocket? Holly berry, hook, and line, a folded car in the shape of a whale. In archaeological terms, no magic coin, and in the heart of the sea, the turtle, this box. We will be luminous in our tattered gear, boating across oceans, where our lips afford the sweetest tasting. Such thirst, our tongues, like foreign bodies, clank against our teeth. Though the sea hides most of our secrets, nobody sits in the white plastic chair on the jetty you'll find at 11 degrees 35 minutes north. 165 degrees, 23 minutes east. My boat of bird feathers withstood many sharks, but today it leaks inexplicably. An octopus wrapped herself round the windlass. She changes colour before we go down. And um, those map coordinates were, um, might be familiar to you, they're for Bikini Atoll. And I'm sure uh, Jasmine will be asking me about that a bit more later. Um, so I'd just like to finish then with some couple of new poems. Um, one's called The Beauty Keepers, um, and this is for Mr. and Mrs. Fitzsimons. The Beauty Keepers. My mother's friend grew flowers and vegetables. The statue she promised to put out in her field to stop the rain had been placed outside the morning before. And on the day of the party, when it rained, the birds divided their songs cautiously among cloud breaks. Jackdaws perched on the macrocarpa, now topped, now they perch elsewhere, and peered at visitors sipping champagne on the lawn. Blue tits foraging intimate bathroom window branches of a cherry tree retreated to the shrubbery. At their farm, traded for shopping centres, roadworks, her husband is still digging potatoes still selling cabbages on Saturday mornings. He listens for blackbirds, singing among the currants, watches goldfinches harvest the thistles, holding the miracles. They keep a, a statue for future needs.
and I'll end with Sandy Cove, which was published by um, Maria Isakova Bennett in her um, lovely Coast to Coast to Coast publication of books. Sandy Cove. A heron, ankle deep in kelp, turns and creeps, her neck stretched out, startles, hunts her way across the intertidal zone. I stalk the bird who stalks the rock pool shadows. Here hops a shat sparrow down to the kelp. He picks morsels from fluorescent sea lettuce. The grey heron snags a fish. Next day, the shoreline feeds one wagtail and two hooded crows. Five seals rest on half submerged rocks like boats. Then I hear sweet singing off key. Lift these bogged old binoculars and watch the seals open their mouths in song. Faces turn, snout to snout. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, we're going to have some music. That was fabulous. We're going to have some music next from um, Claire, and then we're going to come back to a conversation with Jane and Linda. from Helen's Bay in Belfast, County Armagh. I'm delighted to be playing a couple of songs today for the conversation with Jane Robinson and Linda Norton. Here's a song called Lasser Lastifos, Keep the Flame Burning. <laughs> Sagilana, Lee, Lee, 
Thanks very much, uh, Claire. That was really great. Beautiful voice and a uh, great guitar, great combination. Um, so welcome, uh, Jane Robinson and Linda Norton. Welcome back. And uh, the two of you are going to talk. And um, I suppose I'll just kick it off by asking uh, from that music. The two of you have been involved with collaborations uh, quite recently. Jane, you have that uh, wonderful musical collaboration with uh, Malachi Robinson and uh, Linda, you're coming up on the 11th of November, am I right, in San Francisco with musicians and artists and so on. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, Jane, you go. Um, well, yeah, I, I've had a very interesting um, year of collaboration um, with the musician and composer um, Malachi, who's actually, he's my first cousin, so we share a name, but um, he's a very professional musician and um, it's really taken me uh, to another place with my writing in the sense that he's a very quick collaborator. So if I, you know, the first time we met, I, I produced something that was a first draft and he'd immediately composed music the day after. So I had to really improve my game. And um, it made me think a lot about closed stanzas, because when I write, I often have a sort of a flow down, down the poems that I write, and, and I tend to have stanzas that run into each other. And um, with the, you know, thinking about fitting the music in around them and making spaces, um, I began to use more closed forms, which was really interesting for me um, uh, in terms of craft. Um, and the the subject matter um, was uh, it's it's a it's a poem cycle called for the atoll, so um, it's to do with arms testing. So it's very difficult subject matter, and it's really not something you know something I maybe touch on really occasionally um, working by myself, but it's not something that I would be able to bring myself to focus on for a whole poem cycle if I didn't have a collaborator and a bursary and everything kind of waiting for it to happen. So, yeah, it, it's been very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, first, I want to say I was struck that Jane went to Caltech. Um, that's, that's quite amazing and impressive. That's a lot, a lot of uh, knowledge to bring to poetry. It's beautiful. Um, my collaborations, uh, the thing that's coming up on November 11th is at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and it's in the gallery where the Joan Mitchell painting show is being held. And I'm reading with one other poet, and then we are surrounded by musicians. So uh, I don't know if I'll write anything new for that. I have, I was married to a painter and I have a lot of stuff about painting in my book, so I might read some of those things. Um, but I have collaborated with uh, a composer, Eve Baclarian, on a couple of pieces of music and it's one of the peak experiences of my life because I love music above all things. I also consider my kids collaborators in my book because I write a lot about them and so I kind of need their permission. And I also um, quote some of their poems that they've written. Um, and, uh, and then my collages are always collaborations because I use found photos or documentary photos. So I'm basically answering back something that already exists or um, seeing in a different way. So yeah. It's, uh, I was a publisher for many years and was much more comfortable publicizing other people's books and fostering other people than standing out on my own as a writer. So I thought that would be a good challenge for middle age to kind of stop being so afraid. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned yeah. using um, quotes from your daughter, Isabel, and you write about uh, other family members, particularly your brother, Joey, um, who's gone a long time. But um, yeah. do you find, do you, do you ask permission before publishing these things or? Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I can't, I can't ask permission. My book is jam packed with other human beings, as you know, both of them. And I can't ask for permission from everybody. Um, but I do 
make sure there are some good bits that I had to take out about my kids because I had to protect their privacy. Um, and I'll tell you that in the pub when I come to Ireland in the spring. Um, but uh, I do let people see it. Um, not everybody, but my ex-husband, his wife, I let them read the manuscript to make sure it was okay uh, with them because I also mentioned their two young children by name. So, you know, I've lost a lot of sleep doing this kind of writing. It's uh, it's ethically complicated and I can only hope that I've I've done it well enough. It's it's I'm obsessed with the ethical issues around writing about other people. But then of course you answer that partly by writing extremely honestly about yourself as you can. And yeah, in your books Public Gardens and Whiteout. Um, mm. They're 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 largely a lot of it is uh, kind of diary entries and kind of snippets from uh, the public gardens from about 1987 through to 95, and then uh, Whiteout from about 97 through to 2016. So is there a number three in the in the making? Yeah, at the moment? yeah. I do want to say about the cutting off point of 2016. Uh, it ends right before Trump's election, but all the politics, all the issues of race, all the gender issues, American history, by the time Trump is elected, at least by my experience with American history in my life, it's inevitable. It's inevitable that someone horrible like Trump would be elected in America. Uh, and that to me, that's how the book reads, like uh, a long wind up to something terrible. Um, yeah, the third book is what I'm calling the Irish book because it's about uh, Alice Lyons, um, who we all know and love, uh, carried at a show in Ireland in 2014, and she'd never met me, but she she uh, read my book and she wrote to me on email. And I do want to say to everybody, um, write to writers because it's very lonely to be a writer, and then someday people will write to you students um and uh so she she got a grant from the u.s embassy in dublin and she brought me over there and there was a big show of my collages and um and on that trip i went down to Kerry because my father's mother is from there and i i've always hated a lot of things about the sentimentality of irish americans and um i associate them in america with policing and therefore, therefore racism in the US. However, um, she wasn't married when she had my father. And then I had, I learned that her mother had died in the insane asylum in Killarney, which was called the, the Asylum for the Lunatic Poor. So I went down there and I researched it and um, not all of the book, but some of the book will be about them, but also about the Great Depression in the US when both my parents were born and uh, documentary photographs. And uh, it ended up, all my trips to Ireland have been almost comically joyous, um, considering the subject matter that brought me there. And so maybe I get to write a happy, a happy ending. Um, Jane, do you um, do you journal as well, or keep a, kind of a record, or do you think it's important to keep a record as you're going along? Um, in some ways, uh, I I don't journal in a standard way. I do keep notebooks on the go. I I'm a little bit scattered though, so I have too many notebooks going at the same time. So I have a I'm a little bit challenged in terms of consecutive you know, uh, work. In some ways I find that exciting and interesting because if I pick up a, a notebook at random and put something new in, um, then the, you know, the, 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 the different thoughts um, complement each other and, and spark off ideas. So in some ways I like that haphazard way of working um, as long as it doesn't get too out of hand. So I'm really interested in your collages, Linda. Are they visual collages? Sorry, I have never seen yeah, both of my books have my collages on the cover. Um, okay. And, and do they... I, I, want to, I want to say that um, 
it's hard to get my books in Ireland, but they're in the IT Sligo Library for anyone who wants to go look at them. Um, and the best way to see my collages probably is to go to, um, if you Google Linda Norton, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art Open Space, there'll be five essays and they all have tons of collages in there. And there's one essay that's actually about making collages. Um, and I don't make any separation between my writing and my making of visual art. And it's a very modest kind of art. Uh, you know, they're all no bigger than this computer screen. And sometimes they're just like as big as the palm of my hand. And then they, they go together. And I'm interested in what, can, what one can say, uh, when I can, what I can say with images that I can't say with writing. So. And, and do you use them to say something or do they spark off, you know, new, new avenues of thought and writing? They, um, geez, what, what can I say about it? Uh, I mean, the series that showed in Ireland was called Dark White. And you could say that they were very much about sexuality, race, gender, history, who's, who's left out of the the story. Um, many, many of the things that people in Ireland have been dealing with about, uh, well, I grew up in Boston. And when I come to Ireland and I say to a stranger that I grew up in Boston, they say, oh, I spotlight. And then if I say that my father's mother was from Ireland and she wasn't married to say, oh, Philomena. And um, in a way, a lot of my work is about those themes, um, which are honestly, it's it's all about shame busting. There's just a, a tremendous amount of shame, and I'm just trying to deal with it and make something beautiful too. The paint is the paint makes them beautiful. Jane, uh, can I just ask you quickly about um, your your bikini at all sequence and how that came about and what's happening with it now. I was able to see some of it on uh, YouTube with, with uh, Malachi and the Farflum trio. Yeah, so there's a really brief clip there, um, partly because um, that's the one that's one poem that's already published. It was in Skylight 47. Um, you know, uh, we may, uh, Malachi's keen to put more clips up, so we're waiting for a couple more poems to be published. There's one, there's a ballad forthcoming in Channel magazine, um, the, the, uh, the Irish um, journal, uh, environmentalist literary journal Channel. So Channel 5 is launching soon. And then there's another one coming in abridged. Um, so yeah, I'm placing the poems and uh, I feel very, uh, uh, this is our second, this was our second outing at the Redline Book Festival, a live performance, not recorded, just live, which was really fun, actually, after so many online, online things. And um, I was very pleased with the way it went. And it felt like a conclusion of the sequence, which has really been bothering me for a full year and more um, in the sense of kind of feeling that I needed to complete it. And, and um, um, I have a bit of a superstition, actually, if I if I write about something um, you know, often bothered and worried about trouble, troublesome things like environmental deterioration or whatever it is that we humans are doing to the world. But I really feel in my writing that I need to balance out those sort of warnings with um, positive observations and poems that dwell on on things that are right, maybe. Um, so I, I do consciously try to balance things. So I'll be, I'm actually <laughs> relieved to be getting on to, to kind of now fashion my second collection and put together, put together other poems to balance out the, the adult sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm so sorry, the time has just gone uh, really fast and we're going to have to uh, wrap up this conversation, which I think could go on a lot longer. Um, uh, I'd just like to thank you all. Uh, your books are fantastic. And I don't have, I'm, I couldn't find Jane's book this morning, which I have, so you can hold it up again. And it's a really wonderful poetry collection. Journey Sorry. to the, Journey to the uh, Whale. And Melinda's two books are available in Sligo Library if uh, and elsewhere. And 
So I'd like to say thank you very much and I'll pass it over to thank Patricia who is going to host a, a Q&A session and an open mic. Thank you. Thank you. That was a real pleasure to have Linda and Jane read from their work and share so much of the process and conversation with Jessamine. It was certainly inspiring. There's much appreciation of our poets coming in on the Zoom chat. So next is the Q&A and thanks to everyone for your comments and questions. Okay, so a lot of appreciation. Uh, Maeve McCormick, loving this, Linda. Audrey Robinson, a man with extension cords around his waist, waiting to be plugged in. Brilliant image. Alice Lyons, wonderful, Linda, thank you. Kevin McClellan, powerful, Linda, thank you. Hazel O.G., lovely, Linda, Rita. Els Grahel, thank you, Linda. Really too stunned to say anything insightful. Just wonderful, thank you. Saline Kilcoyne, Linda, that was great. And Alice Lyons, thank you for reading some favourite passages, Linda, gorgeous. So we second all of that. And some from Jane, Audrey Robinson. These are so disturbingly beautiful, striking and sad. Mm. Roshi Noche, glue to these. Saline Kilcoyne, I love your poems. Maeve McCormick, wonderful. Thank you. Brought back lovely memories of Sandy Cove at the end. Mm. And we also had some appreciation of our wonderful singer, Claire Sands. Uh, Saline Kilcoyne wrote, love your energy and your voice. And Audrey Robinson wrote, what a presence she has. Great voice and gorgeous setting. Uh, Fergus Hogan joining from Waterford wrote, lovely evening of readings and conversation. Thank you all. And now for the questions. Una Mannion wrote, Jane, thank you so much for your gorgeous reading. I'm interested in the collaboration you spoke about and said it is about arms testing. Could you say a little bit more about that, please? Um, okay. <laughs> um, so to answer your question about, um, I suppose what I was trying to do was take the situation at Bikini Atoll, which uh, uh, where um, the US government exploded 23 test shots, um, which is the euphemism for trying out a nuclear weapon. Um, and I think so so and um, my horror over that you know it's always been there but it grew i was very very fortunate to spend um a week uh on a coral reef you know snorkeling and seeing it just is absolute paradise when you see the coral and the, the, the brightly colored fish swimming around and it's, it's probably like the hedgerows and things used to be before people you know, before the insects began to decline, it was kind of everything buzzing and full of life and color. And, and mm -hmm. sort of that, that combined with, you know, just the, the very strange oddness of, of what human beings do to the world. Um, so I really felt compelled to, to write about it. And it's something that's been going around in my head for quite a while. And then I heard um, the Far Flung Trio, who are really fabulous musicians, um, uh, it's a trio of a violinist, uh, Catherine Hunka, who's the um, the leader of the Irish Chamber Orchestra, and Dermot Dunn, who's a brilliant accordionist, and then Malachi, who Malachi Robinson, who's a double bassist for the Irish Chamber Orchestra as well. And so they get together, and then you know they're really virtuoso, and they play very energetic and beautiful music. And when I heard them give a concert with you know great drama and and um, beauty as well that, that's that's the sound that needs to accompany um this series of poems so it was actually quite um um you know i, I don't think i would have asked if if malachi hadn't been my cousin but he said yes and so we we uh, we collaborated and we got a bursary and funding and took it from there um so it's yeah it's been really really interesting to 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 do this pretty intensive collaboration and um, 
you know, it's it's something that that has bothered me for a long time. There's a poem that I, I decided not to read tonight in my first collection, Journey to the Sleeping Whale, which is about the Trinity test. And um, mm -hmm. I suppose, you know, studying Cal in Caltech, we're very close to JPL and, uh, you know, to New Mexico, where the first, uh, the, the Trinity test which was the first ever test of a nuclear weapon occurred. Um, I just, the sort of the horror at that kind of um, thing. It, it 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 takes a long time to write a very short poem about something like that. I find. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jane. It's fascinating. Another question for you, Linda. This time, Una Mannion wrote, "I am struck by the intergenerational weight of the past in your writing. Can you say something about this, please?" Yeah, jeez, um, yeah, it's a major theme, um, and um, you know, in our bodies, in our history, in our names. I'm very interested in names, uh, um, and of course, I'm I'm writing in some ways when I write about my father's mother. I'm writing about illegitimacy which if you can tell me a more misogynist word in the language, I don't know what it is, you know. Um, a baby is illegitimate because he doesn't have a father on his birth certificate. Um, but then I live in America, so I live in a country where um, black people lost everything and many were illegitimate. So our country is kind of built on this crime so you know I'm, I'm always thinking about what 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 is called epigenetics really um the embodiment of of trauma um and of course my in my work with students at it sligo some of this stuff comes up sometimes in the writing that's shared but sometimes in more in one-on-one -on -one conversations that we're having about how to how to write about difficult things um, now I'm hoping that the generation of, of my children um, and my sisters and, and brothers' children um, has a has a better life. But I would say it's been it's tough going, and I think all of this stuff also affects class and educational opportunities. And uh, yeah. Uh, I see a lot of a lot of reason for hope, but the hope that I don't have is because of the environmental stuff. So I'm very interested in what Jane is saying because, of course, everything we're talking about fits into a place where we need air and water to live. So I don't really write about that, but I'm glad Jane does. Thanks, Linda. It certainly affects all of us. So it's so wonderful to get your insight into your writing. Uh, one final question. Roshi Noche has a question for Jane. Your poems remind me of Heaney's Bog Poems and Baker's The Peregrine. Whose style of nature writing do you admire? Um, well, uh, that's a great compliment. Thank you. Um, so I, I was just reading some poems by Paddy Bush um, earlier today, and uh, so I recommend his nature writing. Um, that's the most recent beautiful nature writing that I've read. So Paddy Bush is, as you know, a poet from Kerry. Excellent. We'll be all reading Paddy Bush now for the next few weeks. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes. Next up this evening is our open mic. And reading tonight are Kevin O'Connell, Rosaline Glennon, and Colm Lawler. First to the open mic this evening is Kevin O'Connell. Over to you, Kevin.
to put all no chubby faces. I'm a daffodil in a park. The picking of me is most forbidden. Read the signs. A boy emerges, an avoider. Must be to be here at this hour. Hands in pockets, hood overhead, heading to the dead end. Who are not for picking. Read the signs. And then this other poem is called Another Monday. Suddenly my mind has a space, a happy kind of emptiness. Any badness was exaggerated. I'm grand. The pain is past. I enroll a black bin bag, pick up my remains, empty the bin. A little space to accompany the mind. I trip to Tesco, walk not bus. My stomach tingles with premature gratitude and my basket of healthiness. Text to my parents, instant replies, short conversation, progress slow but substantial. The door is unlocked. She enters the room, sits on the edge of my bed, and we talk through the night. Love is imaginable. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Really atmospheric reading there. Next to the open mic is Rosaline Glennon. Over to you, Rosaline. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a piece of prose and it's called Handbag. This bag was big and black and made of leather. The awkward gold clasp made a chunky sound when it was being opened or closed. She tipped the contents onto the floor. A pole mint, the last one, with a silver paper wrapper congealed to it. A bottle of 4711 Eau de Cologne, the kind you tip onto your finger like holy water. A child's booty wrapped in tissue, a child she had lost, perhaps. Various coins, two and sixpences, and a truppany bit with a hair on it. When Grange Gorman, the mental institution, fell into disrepair and eventually closed down, they found all these handbags in the attic. They belonged to the women who were incarcerated there. Also found were family photos and letters worn at the folds, the words barely legible. A receipt from a dress shop, Cassidy's in Georgia Street, for a taking in alteration made to an already tiny waist, a pair of white gloves with a lace frill. When she opened the bottle of 4711, she could get the scent of her aunt. Thank you, Rosaline. Beautiful descriptive piece there. Colm Lawler is next to the open mic. Over to you, Colm. So uh, I have uh, two poems to read. My first one is a uh, um, a ghost poem because it's Halloween season. <coughs> Wind blows through dust. I am a ghost in my own house. Wood rots and marble grows moss, shingles crumble and crash to the ground. What vines will grow over these walls, like so many memories spreading over my mind? People come and go, but they do not keep me company. They do not even know I am here, or ever was, or ever will be. I am unseen, unable to leave. Even after the cockroaches have left, this shell of a, a, a haunted house abandoned me to fade away with the tick-tock of the clock. Wind blows through dust. I am a ghost in my own house. I am no longer here. There is no one here but me. Um, the second poem I'm going to read. Um, if you've been to the word before, uh, I have read a poem that I wrote about my boyfriend uh, called Happiness. And um, I'm going to read essentially a sequel to that poem because uh, my boyfriend is now my fiance. Um, <clears throat> Happiness came home one day and wrapped me in a blanket to keep me warm through the cold. I had longed for happiness's arms around my shivering shoulders and I have them now and more. Happiness came home one day and smiled a perfect smile with a giggle and a hop. I had longed for happiness's love to fill my whole heart up and I have it now with joy. Happiness came home one day and got down on one knee and asked a tearful question. I had longed for happiness's ring around my loving finger, and I have it now forever. Thank you. Beautiful column, and congratulations. Your boyfriend has excellent taste. <laughs> Delighted you're engaged. 
So thanks, Kevin, Rosaline and Colm for adding to the evening by sharing your writing in the open mic. We have more music from Claire Sands to close off the evening. But I want to say a massive thank you to Linda Norton, Jane Robinson, Jessamine O'Connor for this lovely event and to Claire Sands for her beautiful music. The word returns with Mike McCormick on Wednesday, the 24th of November. Looking forward to it already. See you then and enjoy the music that's going to close us out. Good night for now. I'm going to finish up with a Sligo song. This is a song called Inta Bebio, which was written in Enniscrone in County Sligo. And it's great to be alive here today in Belfast. On a beautiful sunny Sunday morning.